Well, a warm welcome uh, to my talk tonight on uh, Britain's greatest artist. I think uh, he would make the top uh, top rank of many uh, uh, lists of artists. Uh, uh, certainly, we've looked at Constable before, but uh, Turner's the breadth of Turner's career is something that uh, really tackling in just an hour and a little bit uh, is uh, an enormous task. Uh, so I have picked out certain. Uh, phases of his work and uh, certain crucial works that I think nobody who's looking at Turner uh, would want to miss. I'm also trying to set him in the context of his times. He, uh, Turner was born in 1775 on uh, the 23rd of April uh, and he was born in Maiden Lane in uh, Covent Garden in the heart of London and uh, so it, it is um, from London that we're going to look at, look at Turner. Uh, we, we look at his associations with the Royal Academy uh, and with many of the leading figures of, of his time. Uh, many of the photographs are original photographs that I've taken at Petworth House uh, and where possible, I've tried to take photographs uh, in the Claw Gallery at Tate Britain. Uh, and uh, if anybody is interested, uh, I'm, I'm quite prepared to uh, produce a PDF of this a talk, uh, which will mean that you can examine some of these pictures in higher resolution um, following my talk, uh, and uh, I can make arrangements for that with you. So let's have a little look at a, a timeline for Turner. As I say, he was born in Covent Garden in uh, 1775. His early years were spent in, in Covent Garden. Uh, he probably lodged with his uh, uncle in Brentford. Now, Brentford is to the west of London on the River Thames. The River Thames plays a very important part in Turner's life. Uh, indeed, some of, some of his finest paintings uh, concern the River Thames and, and the, the river traffic of the River Thames. And Turner in later years employed a boatman on the River Thames. And Turner, when he wasn't painting, enjoyed a spot of fishing, as we shall find out. Uh, Turner, after a period of colouring some engravings and uh, um, some work with an architect, uh, entered the Royal Academy schools in 1789. His, early, his earliest work are really an exploration of um, architecture and topography. And uh, so he's, he's, uh, he, he, he's an exceptionally uh, talented young man and certainly his teenage years uh, are marked out by uh, someone who has, has a very, very good natural uh, understanding, particularly of the use of watercolour, uh, drawing and particularly pictorial space right from the beginning. His first actual continental tour didn't take place until 1802, mainly because of, of uh, the wars within Europe. He produces a wonderful folio in the early years of the 19th century uh, that really increases his fame and his collaboration with uh, um, Turner of Oxford enables this, this, this portfolio of prints which really expand uh, his, his work. He covers much of England during the Napoleonic era, and we think also of his tours of both the Lake District and Wales, and uh, some of the fine topographic works of that period. And of course, his uh, very, very important painting of the Battle of Trafalgar. Uh, his first visit to Italy via Switzerland was in 1819, and, and that was a, a very, very important uh, trip for Turner. It had a profound effect upon his on his style, uh, particularly uh, his understanding of colour, and it brought him into contact with uh, with the with the world, the classical world, in in a, in a new way. Uh, we have some very very fine paintings from the period of the mid eighteen twenties. Uh, through to the through to about 1838, we have some very very fine and memorable paintings. Uh, we also during this period we have his long association uh, with um, uh, the Egremont uh, Lord Egremont at um, at uh, Petworth House um, and uh, uh, Turner's association there. And I've got some nice photographs of uh, some of the Petworth paintings. Uh, we will be looking at some of his maritime paintings. Of course, he is the preeminent maritime painter of, of Great Britain. 
Uh, and then we look at his uh, fine color, color works, the Venetian, Venetian works, uh, dating from 1833 to 45. Uh, we look at his associate, continual fascination and association with Switzerland and the path of, path of St. Gothard. And then we come to his later work and some controversial work uh, following the, the, the in the 1840s, um, uh, his, his work, his colour beginnings as, a, as they're known of, uh, and some of the unfinished works, his legacy, and we're also looking at uh, critical responses to his work and uh, uh, Ruskin's defence of his, of his work and, and the uh, start of modern painters. And then we look a little bit at the leg his legacy bequeathed to the British nation. Uh, now I include in the bottom right hand corner uh, a couple of symbolic things. One is a barber's pole. He was a son of a barber and wig maker in Covent Garden. And uh, Turner spent a lot of time in the barber shop. And the barber shop was very important uh, as an early part of his life because his father would often shave the heads of many of the Royal Academicians who had come up from Somerset House, uh, just, a, just a few, um, you know, quarter of a mile away uh, to, uh, to have either their wigs uh, worked upon or um, uh, have their heads shaved. And so uh, Turner's father, who is a crucial figure in Turner's life, um, uh, knew many of the Royal Academicians, and this actually accounts for uh, Turner's um, passage, really, uh, and his work becoming uh, known by uh, well-known artists of that era, uh, particularly as Turner is was definitely from a working class background and uh, was not considered a gentleman. So he's highly unusual as an entrant to the Royal Academy, uh, even, even um, artists like uh, John Constable, for instance, uh, were um, they had some money behind them and business behind them. Uh, um, he was a, a son of a mill owner. Uh, so no such thing with Turner and really down to his, his sheer skill as an artist that he he um, becomes a probationer in, in the Royal Academy schools. Turner says, my job is to paint what I see, not what I know. And, th and this uh, is, abides throughout his whole life, that he is somebody who's moving on. It's not a static style. Uh, there are many great pre preoccupations within his work, uh, and there are constants within his work, but uh, he definitely um, is someone who continually develops. Uh, what should we say about Turner? What, what, what singles him out as, uh, as this character of supreme importance in the history of art. Well, he is a highly prolific artist, uh, something like 2,000 finished oils. We have about 200 unfinished works, at least. Uh, we have 19,000 works upon paper, many of them highly finished and very significant works. We have uh, boxes full of sketchbooks uh, and lots of um, paraphernalia from, from studios. Uh, so we have an awful lot of material and, and much of it is in, is in the National Collection. He is an artist, uh, the preeminent artist of the Romantic period, of British art, a great period of British art. He is a master of pictorial space and perspective. And I'm going to show you a couple of his wonderful perspective uh, teaching diagrams. Um, he was no slouch when it came to producing uh, pictorial uh, di diagrams to help other artists and uh, to teach. He was a professor of perspective at the Royal Academy. He has complete mastery of the oil painting medium. This is in an age when you had to grind down your own paints and mix them up with balsams and, uh, and walnut oil and linseed oil. It, it, was a, it was a laborious process, but he's a he has technical mastery over oil paint uh, and watercolor and indeed all media he, he was very highly proficient in. As I say, he is a very experimental artist. Uh, much of his work, uh, in this romantic period also con concerns uh, a pessimism about human nature and there is a, there is a, that going on within his work and we'll see that exemplified by some of his themes. Uh, he is an artist who is the artist of the Industrial Revolution and unlike uh, his contemporary John Constable, Turner embraces the Industrial Revolution. Uh, he looks to science as, as a, a salvation really uh, from uh, many, many of the uh, difficulties that beset um, uh, mankind. And so uh, we notice his interaction with scientists and with science and with industry is, is a very active dialogue. 
he moves from the sail age to the steam age. Um, and that's exemplified in many of his great paintings of the 1840s, particularly. Great watercolorist. Uh, he is also considered um, something of uh, his later experiments, known as color beginnings, are uh, seen in, in by some as uh, an early interest in abstraction. But it's a very different form of abstraction to, shall we say, uh, the abstract work of the uh, modernists of the uh, early 20th century. And uh, Turner believed that landscape could convey the full range of artistic, historical and emotional meanings. That is that he wasn't like um, uh, uh, Joshua Reynolds, who believed landscape painting was a lower form of art. The history painting was the, 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 the top uh, type of painting that uh, serious artists should aspire to. Uh, Turner raised uh, landscape painting to a much higher level and it wove it in with history painting. And so his paint, he, he elevates landscape painting within uh, our national life and also uh, within the European context as well. And he's an artist who did succeed in his goals. Um, he comes at what we call, he bookends really uh, what is known as the golden age of British art. And I, and I show you this slide uh, by way of a context for what is a glorious um, period uh, of, of British art, beginning with uh, the great William Hogarth uh, um, from the century before, um, an artist who was also a, a great theorist as well as a great printmaker, and um, his, his paintings are of satire and, and an examination of society are extremely important paintings. He is seen as the first great uh, British homegrown painter. We then look to the establishment of the Royal Academy in 1768 under Sir Joshua Reynolds, um, coming out of the St Martin's Lane Academy, uh, of which Hogarth was a part of. We think of the Scottish Enlightenment, which produced a great artist like uh, Alan Ramsay and Sir Henry Rayburn, just slightly eclipsing the Turner period, but great artists from the North. We think of the great Sir Thomas Lawrence, also whose career eclipses Turner's career, an artist who uh, charts the great and the good. Uh, and really picks up on the on Thomas Gainsborough's tradition uh, of, of uh, portraiture, particularly among uh, high society. Turner's near contemporary, born a year after um, uh, Turner, uh, John Constable. Uh, at the time, we will, we will find out that he is, he is not as appreciated as a greater artist at the time. He's seen as far more parochial uh, during uh, this period. Um, but has risen to great levels, and we can see parallels within the work, and uh, indeed a begrudging respect at times between the two artists. Thomas Gainsborough, of course, is one of the great uh, flowerings of the um, 18th century in British art, and his, his work formed the uh, core collection of, of the new National Gallery, which came out of Sir George Beaumont's collection, and under um, Charles Locke Eastlake as, as we develop the National Gallery. And that's an important aspect of Turner's work too. Uh, George Romney, again, one of the great painters of the Golden Age. And not forgetting the first woman uh, uh, Royal Academy member, Angelica Kaufman, the Swiss artist, um, whose, uh, whose work is, is now uh, getting some of the recognition that it, it truly deserves. The great animal painter, George Stubbs, who died in 1806, but one of the very great uh, British artists. And then we have Joseph Wright of Derby, and I include him here because of his uh, great interest in science and um, the scientific process and engineering and, and the Industrial Revolution. So it's a fascinating period that, that Turner um, comes into and uh, succeeds with. His, one of his very early patrons uh, was um, Sir Richard Colt Hoare, and uh, he employed uh, Turner to produce uh, some of these lovely paintings here, these, these watercolours here of Salisbury Cathedral. Now we're looking at, uh, well, something like, uh, what, uh, 45 years before um, uh, the, the great Constable paintings of um, Salisbury that, that we know of at uh, 
um, Archdeacon Fisher's uh, garden. Uh, but these these are these are very early examples of um, uh, Turner's mastery and with with watercolor. And these are um, wonderful wonderful examples of both his uh, skill as a, a, a with a capturing architecture and perspective, but also with atmosphere and light. And we see these things. If you look at that one in the bottom right hand corner of the cloisters at Salisbury from 1802, you can see someone who's got a, a really great understanding of architecture, who can draw architecture without necessarily uh, making an architectural drawing. And that's very important. And Turner is an artist who doesn't shy away from difficulty uh, within a painting and, uh, and, and he is able to create these enormous spaces within his work. And this is evident very early on. Um, he was a part of um, Thomas Monroe's Academy, which is like a, a, a little society. Many of these uh, occur in London at the time. Uh, so he, he, he knew both uh, Peter de Wint, Thomas Girton, John Sell Cotman, all were part of this group. And uh, this watercolour circle was, was, an, was an important uh, feature of Turner's early life. As a young man, and those are what that's one of the wonderful watercolors of John Sell Cotman of the Norwich School, which was emerging during this period. And uh, so, artists like um, Cousins were, were very important, and uh, uh, John Crome. So, there were artists who were working from landscape, but very much uh, based around Norwich. Uh, Turner was a man who always traveled, and he saw travel as a great stimulus to his art. To, for him to produce uh, ever greater paintings. And, and he was a restless traveler. Whilst always returning to London, he uh, spent great periods of time away from home as well. And this is his first exhibited oil painting at the Royal Academy. And it's a sea piece and it's um, uh, 1796. And it was exhibited with lines from Thompson's poem, The Seasons, uh, a favourite by many romantic artists, actually. And then Constable later actually quotes from The Seasons for one of his paintings of Hadley Castle. Uh, Turner's first attempt at oil painting was criticised by the Sir George Beaumont, who, who, whose collection actually includes the sort of foundational connection of uh, the National Gallery in London. Uh, but uh, Turner um, was criticised because he wasn't he wasn't taught oil painting as such. He, he, what he learned, he learned from looking at the collections of other painters and uh, observing some of his colleagues at the Academy. Uh, but he he mastered oil paint pretty quick. Uh, but he was accused of using watercolour type techniques on, on an oil painting. And of course, he develops uh, within oil painting, so he surpasses even some of the greats, uh, even Claude himself. So he, he was, he fully masters oil paint within the next 10 years. And, uh, but this is a great example of his very, very first exhibited uh, oil painting at the Royal Academy, and it caused a sensation. Uh, and although it didn't please Beaumont so much, uh, many have re recognized this as, a, as an excellent example of his, of his earlier, early work. And he goes in eight, in 1798. He goes on a tour of Wales, and again he's he's working uh, for Sir Richard Colt Hoare, whose um, uh, castle is Hampton Court Castle, which is in Herefordshire, not Hampton Court by the River Thames. And uh, Turner goes to Wales, and he has in the back of his mind. Uh, the, the artist of the former century, Richard Wilson, who was, a, who was a, an artist who uh, uh, painted a number of very pleasing landscapes, um, but uh, they don't have the atmosphere of a Turner by any means. But he is an artist who was considered an important uh, painter, a Welsh painter uh, from uh, the previous century. And so Turner goes with that in mind, and he produces many, many uh, such watercolours as these that I can show you here. And his are characterised by... Um, a brilliant observation. Uh, he doesn't uh, stylize some of the peaks. Uh, there's always this great sense of light and space. If we look at that painting looking towards Snowden 1800, terrific, terrific watercolor painting, Turner's always able to pack in an awful lot into a small space. And he's not afraid to leave blank areas too. He, uh, he, he produces many, many sketchbooks, and we're very, very fortunate that uh, for Ruskin's cataloguing of, um, uh, of Turner's sketchbooks initially, and uh, it helps us as we research his work now to understand um, how he developed his ideas about this. But he produces these wonderful uh, drawings and paintings in, in Wales, and 
and also the Lake District. And, and it's very, very important uh, to Turner. These, these early travelling uh, periods out of London uh, were immensely important to him. And this 1800 work of um, Dolbarden Castle in North Wales is his diploma work. Every artist um, from, from Joshua Reynolds setting up of the Royal Academy was required to produce um, a piece that was uh, like their, their diploma. It's almost like an exam piece, which the Royal Academy missions would either accept or reject, and then you would be made an, an associate of the Royal Academy. And, and uh, he produces this at the age of 24 years old. And as you can see, it already um, contains much that we consider great about uh, Turner. That is a pictorial space, a great sense of atmosphere, uh, what we call the pathetic fallacy, that is the sky uh, emoting the sentiments of the painting. Um, and uh, in Turner's case here, uh, the interesting thing is he exhibited many, many of his paintings with uh, portions of poetry, not just Thompson, but we also have the first example here of Turner using probably his own words, certainly would not be cited to anybody else, and it's probably from what is collectively known as the fallacy of hope, which is Turner's written um, poetry. Some of it's almost doggerel. These are notes that are kept in his sketchbooks that uh, uh, somehow uh, are attached to many of his paintings. And they tend to mirror uh, romantic poetry. Uh, they have words worthy and sentiment. Uh, Shelley it can be detected in some of them and some of them Byron as well. But they are uh, not necessarily great pieces of poetry, but they show that Turner had a poetic imagination and mind. And remember, he was not a man who had conventional schooling like so many of his compatriots at the Royal Academy. Uh, he came from this uh, poor uh, background or a uh, working background. And um, so his schooling, uh, whilst he could read and write and, uh, and uh, he was a very quick learner, uh, his actual um, speech was often halting and uh, was considered his, his um, roughness of manner was um, often commented upon. There's an example in the corner there of um, uh, a painting Buttermere from 1798, which is another ex excellent example of Turner's earlier painting. And the uh, fallacy of the hope passage here uh, makes um, reference to uh, Owen Glendower. And, and at this time also, uh, the great romantic artist, uh, William Blake, had made a, a visionary head of Glendale. So it was something that was in uh, uh, the, the sort of public sphere at this particular time. It was uh, figures of the romantic movement uh, attached quite a bit to uh, these, these bards and the history of, of Wales. Uh, it, was, it was an important part of, of, of the romantic movement. So uh, that's uh, one of Blake's visionary heads at the same time. And uh, Turner would have known of some of Blake's work if not that one. Now, an artist is nothing if he doesn't have uh, some really strong patrons. And from an early, early period, Turner was very, very fortunate in that he had some very, very loyal and uh, wealthy patrons. One of them, Walter Fawkes, uh, who uh, really is very crucial to Turner's early career, uh, lived, in, lived in Yorkshire at Farnley Hall. And that is a painting uh, painted of um, Turner with Fawkes at Farnley Hall from 1824. Uh, Turner really disliked himself to be painted. We have his famous self-portrait, but, but he was a short man, probably about five foot two of uh, diminutive stature, quite rotund. Um, and uh, he, he disliked uh, having his, uh, well, he would have hated photography, I suppose, and he didn't like him to be drawn. Um, but there we are, that's a painting that got away with it. And that's a picture of uh, him and Fawkes at Farnley Hall. Where they, they went on um, shooting and fishing, and uh, as uh, did many people at this time, it was obviously the sport of the upper classes and Turner would often uh, joined, particularly for fishing, he enjoyed that. So John Lester also was a huge patron of Turner's work, and, and we're grateful to many of the, the, the works that we have in the collections. Our national collection come from Sir John Lester's collection. Um, later on, uh, uh, James Hakewill's collection, uh, very important for some of the Italian works. And I also, at this stage, um, cite uh, Turner's contemporary, uh, Sir Charles Locke Eastlake, 
who becomes more and more important to Turner in many ways in that he is the um, uh, great intellectual scholar of the Royal Academy. Um, he translates Goethe's uh, colour theory in 1840, but he's also a great collector of art and he spends quite a bit of time in Italy acquiring work for the National Gallery. Um, uh, might not go into that tonight how he, how he did acquire some of these wonderful altarpieces and things that we are now so pleased to have in the National Gallery. Um, but uh, Charles Locke Eastlake is an important figure, uh, not necessarily a patron of Turner, but he, he forms something of the milieu, the background to, to Turner's world and, uh, and uh, why Turner um, was considered uh, you know, um, a must have by so many of the, uh, of the great and the good at the time. Um, Turner um, immediately based some of his early works on the greatest, what was considered the greatest landscape painter of all time uh, from uh, Claude Lorraine. Now Claude Lorraine lived um, and worked in Rome and uh, he, uh, from 1600 to 1646. And his works were considered um, by most people to be the greatest landscape works in, in that they uh, had classical themes, but they, um, they had this wonderful aerial perspective, that is, that there was this enormous space, they often include uh, classical ruins, um, that they would include uh, allusions to, um, to Homer and uh, various classics. Uh, and and uh, they were considered, and they were Italianate landscapes, often framed and highly composed. And Turner uh, is aware of a number of these. Beaumont had some in his collection. Uh, so he, uh, some of his early paintings, Turner is deliberately uh, not uh, pastiching Claude, but he is, in a way, as most great artists, follow following in Claude's footsteps. And that's a great example of a very and uh, shall we say a, a young Turner approaching a, a Claudian landscape. Uh, so Claude was very important to Turner and remains so, uh, but I would suggest that Turner, as he moves on in his career, uh, surpasses Claude in, in many, many respects. But Claude's influence abided with him and, and, and Turner continues to uh, take a great interest in, in Claude's work and uh, uh, wherever he can, he makes allusions to it. And some of Turner's greatest paintings, particularly the ones which look into the, it, into the, into the either rising sun or the falling sun, are very much based upon uh, the Claudian ideal. And uh, he produces this great folio, the great folio of prints, the Book of Studies. Um, now, a lot of you will, will have seen uh, another name, Turner, Charles Turner of Oxford. Now, Charles Turner is no relation of, of, of Joseph Turner, uh, um, but the two work together and, and uh, they're a similar age and they're uh, at the Royal Academy. And uh, Turner of Oxford produces the fine prints that produce this, this great uh, book of studies, uh, topographic studies, basically, um, that engaged Turner. And they are really his earlier, earlier magnum opus in a way. They're, they're very, very important. And they include such scenes as this one, like the Little Devil's Bridge. Um, and they include passages through the Alps. Uh, and they are full of this great atmosphere and light. And we've got uh, Charles Turner of Oxford to thank for the wonderful engravings of these works. And although Tur um, Joseph Turner did fall out with Charles Turner, uh, later on, uh, Turner actually, uh, Charles Turner of Oxford is in fact made an executor to J.M.W. Turner's will. So uh, they obviously made it up later on in his life. And it's the age of uh, the Royal Society too. And uh, the interaction between the Royal Society, that is the, the scientists and engineers of the age, and the artists of the age was considered very, very important. The Royal Academy at that time occupied the same building uh, as the Royal Society, a Somerset House. And uh, Turner went to a great number of the lectures and demonstrations by some of these, these great, uh, great people. He went to uh, um, Humphrey Davies' exciting lectures uh, on, uh, with, on electricity and magnetism. Uh, he, he even he, he, he learned a great deal from these things. So, so Davy's work uh, finds its way into, into Turner's own work. 
certainly Michael Faraday uh, was important to Turner. Faraday uh, uh, discussed with Turner how he could make some of his oranges and reds brighter by chemical mixing and uh, the interaction of mineral pigments. Uh, all of these things were very interesting to Turner. And uh, so Turner engage, embraces the scientists of his day, particularly Faraday, uh, in, in, in helping him develop new and um, more interesting colours and pigments because there weren't as many colours available to the artist in Turner's day as, as there are to today. Um, but we have Faraday to thank uh, his collaboration. Turner was also obsessed with um, uh, the motion of the stars, the heavens, and particularly the sun. And so he uh, encounters William Herschel, the German-born astronomer, and musician, and he meets him at the Royal Society. And he is very interested in many of Herschel's uh, theories and speculations about the, the spectrum of light and uh, the also work with the prism as well of breaking up uh, light through a prism. These things concern Turner. And before I, I've also talked about uh, Thomas Forster, who, uh, talks about na the naming of clouds and, and atmospheric conditions. He had been a great influence upon uh, uh, John Constable, but he was equally an influence upon uh, uh, Turner. And Turner was very, very uh, engaged with his work. Turner also made many, many drawings of unusual phenomena in the, in the heavens. And particularly in 1804, he watched the commencement of an eclipse, which he, he there's a sketchbook about this, and uh, he, he was able to share these with members of the Royal Society. So we should not think of art and science as working down separate tracks. Uh, in this particular exciting period of the Industrial Revolution, they were, they were really, uh, there was a really fruitful exchange between these two disciplines. And Turner continues to be interested in these things, and he's interested in a device uh, that uh, uh, for, for rescuing sailors who are trapped on, on at sea. Uh, and in shipwrecks. And he, he continually takes interest in all these things. And later on, he's very interested in steam power and steam engines, steamships, these form a part of his work. And so uh, Turner is, is, a, is a man of his time and a man who uh, paints the modern world. He doesn't try, move things out. He wouldn't be an artist who, if he had a lovely view out the window, he wouldn't remove things like uh, electricity pylons or telegraph poles. He uh, paints all these sort of things into his work. These, these are, this is his world. Um, so he emb embraces it fully and lives with it. But he's also a man who spent some of his earlier years uh, at Brentford, uh, which is the west of London, and he begins on uh, um, uh, trips up the River Thames. And uh, he makes some very, very interesting paintings on the River Thames, both in watercolour and in oil colour. We have some very fine paintings of Windsor Castle, particularly from, from the river. And Turner's also unique too. He employs a boatman to take him up the river. So he's, he's, he's rather like a, a French artist like Daubigny who, who works on a boat, a houseboat. And so he gets these unique effects of light uh, and observes uh, the clouds and the reflections within the water. This, this painting of Walton Bridge uh, from 1805 is incredibly modern. Uh, it could be a Coro, or shall we say a very early Monet, perhaps, it, it, such is its originality. And then we look at the watercolours. He also isn't, uh, um, he doesn't uh, overwork his paintings. If, if he doesn't finish them, he just leaves some of the, some of the colour unfinished. That, that particular one of the Thames from Richmond Hill, 1815, just looks down the Thames from a very, very famous view. That's a lovely view that we can enjoy today, but he doesn't bother to put in all the detail in the foreground. And then he goes all the way up the Thames to Abingdon, and he is interested in the locks at Abingdon, and you can see the Church of Great St Helen in the background there. So he works along the River Thames, and he produces some very fine paintings that are totally recognisable and uh, today. And his dear old father retires from the um, from the wig makers and barbers shop, and Turner designs for him a house um, at Twickenham, and Twickenham. Uh, in the uh, both in the 18th century and early 19th century was a very important place. Uh, Alexander Pope had had lived there. William Hogarth had lived nearby at Chiswick. Uh, Thomas Gainsborough at Kew. Um, so many many artists uh, congregate to the west of London, 
and uh, Turner designed this house for his father, which I can now say has actually been opened and uh, David Attenborough, a resident of Richmond, opened it uh, a few years ago and one can visit Turner's father's house. Uh, which is, uh, although they had the place um, Queen Anne Street and around the corner from Harley Street, uh, this is, is the residence where his father retired to. And Turner and he was, uh, young Joseph Turner would spend time um, fishing here as well as painting. Uh, Turner's um, mother, unfortunately, uh, became mentally very, very ill and she was committed to Bethlehem Asylum, Bedlam. And uh, uh, so there's little spoken about his mother. And we know little about, about his mother really, apart from the memorial slab in the church at Covent Garden. I've included a web link at the bottom of this page, which has many nice little um, film clips uh, where you can visit Turner's house virtually. And, uh, uh, and there's also an artist's uh, perception of uh, what Turner's house meant to him and what it means to us today. Uh, so it was an important place. It was originally called Solus Lodge. And of course, uh, for sun, the, the sun was absolutely important to Turner. Now, this is the first, shall we say, really great painting by Turner. And this is his reflection upon the Battle of Trafalgar uh, of 1805. This is painted the year following uh, Nelson's um, death at the Battle of Trafalgar. And this is a very unique um, uh, oil painting of a, of a, 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 a naval battle. It, 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 it is very, very unusual in its composition, uh, but it was considered by many uh, to be the greatest uh, sea battle painting that had ever been painted when it was exhibited in, in 1808, uh, only three years after Trafalgar. It, it shows uh, uh, Nelson upon the deck of the HMS Victory in the arms of Hardy as, as he is dying. It shows the fighting Temeraire coming in to save, shelter uh, Nelson's flagship. It shows the, the heat of battle. You can see the, 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 the just a mass of rigging and torn sails, and it captures the excitement and the valour and all that what Trafalgar meant and meant to uh, uh, the, the British people uh, this, at the time. And the tremendous hero that Nelson was, of course, you, there was there was uh, so many paintings of Nelson, so many busts of Nelson, such as this one on the right, and. It, it was such an important, an important figure and a turning point, of course, uh, uh, in, in, in the history of um, Europe and, uh, and, 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 this, and, and, and the seas and seeing Britain as the great naval power. Um, so this painting here is, is a very interesting painting. Also, as an artist, I look at it and I say, well, that, you know, if you were painting a sea battle, you might not go about it this way. And yet Turner does something quite unique uh, with, the, with this particular painting and takes us right into the heart of the battle and conveys the story as well. And for it, he spent a great deal of time on the decks of HMS Victory as it was being repaired back in back in Portsmouth. And uh, he, he, he works on this painting. And Turner is forever filling sketchbooks full of accurate drawings of rigging and of sails and of uh, sailors. And Turner is uh, at the Royal Academy. Uh, these are examples of what he might have used. His PowerPoint lectures were these diagrams. And he was made professor of uh, perspective now, Turner was not a confident speaker, public speaker, and so uh, people found his um, delivery of these lectures very, very hard to understand. Uh, he was not, uh, not easily, uh, he didn't communicate well verbally. And yet he produced these wonderful uh, diagrams on perspective, which if we look at them, they are very, very helpful to, uh, to artists and, and the understanding of perspective. But certainly uh, he wasn't necessarily a great teacher in, in the way that uh, uh, Reynolds had been with his discourses or indeed other people like Eastlake and uh, other academicians were. And that is Somerset House, where um, the Royal Academy was at the time, uh, and the Royal Society, uh, the Royal Navy and the Inland Revenue all shared the same building. Uh, but that gives you an example on the right of just Turner's mastery of perspective, that sort of typical watercolour of his. And, uh, and an artist really needs to understand perspective to be able to draw something like that. Uh, he also took great interest in theories on colour. And uh, although, although he wasn't fully... Um, 
signed up to Goethe's color theories, uh, which were translated by Eastlake. He um, he uh, was very interested in other other theories about color and how color might work within painting, uh, and and actually uh, he was as much uh, involved with the the, the, the um, uh, people of the Royal Society in the understanding of color as he was uh, with uh, Goethe's theories on, on colour from the 1840s. And it's the Romantic period. So the other great painters of his period, um, these dramatic scenes, these, these uh, such as uh, James Ward's Scordale Scar, uh, 1815. We think of Robert Cousins, the great watercolourist, who started his paintings just by ink blots and then worked, for, worked them up. Uh, and some of, and of course, he spent a great deal of time in Italy, and uh, and that would that that was beckoning uh, Turner too. And we think of uh, John Constable's sketch paintings uh, at his uh, back in his home uh, in in Suffolk in Dedham. Uh, but uh, these uh, John Constable was was considered far more um, just a parochial artist, not someone who initially uh, was um, up there with Turner at this period. But it was a great period of uh, William Wordsworth and, and uh, all artists would uh, attach um, uh, poetry uh, when, to their works when they exhibited at the Royal Academy in, in, in the summer exhibition, which was uh, the main thing. And it was uh, in 1802 uh, and onwards that Turner then was able to take these, these extended trips to Europe. And... Uh, he makes his first trip to Italy, as we know, in, uh, 18, in 1819. But the past of St Gothard remained extremely important to him. And uh, the, this, this, this Alpine pass, which you can now go, go across uh, with the railway bridge, which goes above the Devil's Bridge, is this cataract within the mountains. And for Turner, it expressed so much about man's insignificance, um, but his pluckiness in, in building a road that clung to the cliff. Um, but the overwhelming forces of nature, you get mists coming up through this, this, this valley. And it fascinated Turner, as it did Ruskin too. And it was seen as as something that that really um, emphasised the sublime in landscape, and of course that is one of Turner's main preoccupations. And so uh, this this pass was somewhere which sort of became uh, um, emblematic of much of Turner's paintings uh, from from uh, Central Europe. And Switzerland was always important to him, but it was a place of um, uh, where he could express some of his deeper, um, more melancholy thoughts, his more pessimistic uh, thoughts are expressed in his paintings of Switzerland. It was when he came to Venice that he was then at ease uh, in the lagoon and and perhaps down, uh, also down in Rome as well. We, get, we don't get that sense that you get in the past St. Gothard. There's another painting there, which was on exhibition at the Ashmolean the other year. And that is the path of St. Gothard as it is today. And the top bridge is in fact the railway bridge, which passes across. And uh, I was very excited to cross that bridge um, about five years ago on the Tretton the Alpine Express and just looking down upon it and uh, and it was just wonderful and, uh, and it, I just felt I was in Turner's painting. And he also paints, uh, here we are, it's the, it's the great period of, of Britain's ascendancy as a maritime nation really, really becomes, um, uh, this is the, the great uh, naval college at Greenwich and uh, from, from the hill from, from uh, looking down towards the back towards London, you see the uh, dome of St Paul's Cathedral in the distance. Uh, at this stage, Greenwich is entirely separate from London, uh, but we can see the Naval College there. And this was a painting commissioned uh, by Walter Fawkes, one of his early patrons, and it exhibits all of all that's great about Turner: a wonderful sky, the river. Uh, the Naval College, the sense of uh, the patriotic, um, the sense of London being uh, a great metropolis, it's all there and Turner can do it so deftly with his beautiful, beautiful touch and, and strokes of, of, of his brush. Uh, Turner too didn't limit himself to just expressing himself well on big canvases like this, but also in these lovely little notebooks. So the one in the top right hand corner will give you a great example of a, a Turner notebook. And these are every page is filled with, with, with little drawings like this, which are beautiful, beautiful things to look at. And then the bottom right hand corner is a detail from a, a Turner painting. And you can just feel the sway of the sea and the spray lashing, lashing the, the uh, ship. 
he wasn't he was following in the tradition of many things there was a, a dutch naval tradition of naval paintings of maritime paintings and even in britain uh prior to turner there was uh deluthaberg's paintings and here's deluthaberg's shipwreck and deluthaberg was a celebrated painter of of the of the, of the late uh, 18th century and early 19th but he was and nothing like as skilled as, as Turner or as, as convincing as Turner. So Turner's painting Shipwreck from 1805, just is, this one is in the Claw Gallery in, in, in London. And it, it just puts you as the, does the Trafalgar right in the heart of the action. And you just feel the overwhelming forces of nature there and the marvelous observation of how waves and the break and form and the foam of the sea, we just get it all there in that painting. Uh, Thomas Cole, the great, the great um, uh, American landscape art artist, uh, actually, he, he, he was British, but he came back uh, to Britain. Um, he was born in Bolton, but he makes his career in, in the USA as part of the Hudson River School. He, he, he idolised Turner, well, certainly from his prints, and he wanted to meet him. But when he meets Turner, he, found, he thought T Turner was like a seafaring man, he said. And he said he couldn't, he couldn't in his mind, uh, think of um, Turner as the same man who painted those paintings. And that was the, many, many people thought that about him, that his manner was brisk and rough. Uh, but uh, Turner was all about his work and, and he's a man who's just so totally dedicated to what he, what he did. And he has so many pictures that he just can't exhibit them all at the summer exhibition every year. He has his own picture galleries. And one particular picture gallery was the was a famous one, which his father was uh, sort of acted as a sort of impresario. He he would welcome the people. Old dad would welcome people to number 10 Queen Anne Street near Harley Street. You go through the door into a darkened room. There you would sit for four or five minutes and you would your eyes would sort of acclimatize to the gloom. And then old Mr. Turner would open the door and you would go into this gallery full of uh, these stunning turning paintings. And they would sort of dazzle your eyes with, with their brightness and with their light. And it was, a, I suppose it was a bit of a trick. It was a bit of showmanship, but it was a way uh, in which he, he captured so many of these great clients and the great and the good and, conti and continued right to the end of his life. Turner had uh, his, his own gallery of his works. But, I, uh, but it is said that after his father, Father's death in 1830 that many of the um uh, the gallery fell into something of a dilapidated state and uh, there were even known to be sort of holes ripped in certain canvases and uh, cats going out of the back of the room and things like that so there's lots of little anecdo anecdotes about it in the Ashmolean museum in oxford we have this turner's body lying in state in one of his gallery in one of his galleries there and that's a nice little painting there. And you can just look at that as painted by George Jones, not the country and Western singer, but a, an artist of the uh, 19th century. And he paints, um, he paints uh, Turner's body and almost light emanating from Turner's coffin. And Turner goes to Brighton. And I, uh, those of you who came to my talk on John Constable will remember Constable painting the chain pier in Brighton. Uh, Constable did loathe the modern world, really, and he dis did dislike painting things like the chain pier. But for Turner, it was a great example of modernity and of uh, a great example of engineering. And there's a little photograph of the chain pier in the bottom left hand corner. And you can see from Turner's uh, painting of it that he's actually looking at the chain pier from a completely different angle to, to Constable. Turner is, is, is on the sea looking at it and it's full of light and there's none of those rolling clouds in that one. Turner uh, uh, was admired by Constable uh, but uh, Constable always never never painted classical uh, illusions in, in his work. They're, they're very, that, that doesn't really occur in Constable's work at all. Uh, but in Turner's, in Turner's case, although even when he's painting, shall we say a straightforward painting like this, uh, we're always in the back of our mind thinking of a Claude painting or maybe a Van der Veld painting or a Van Goyen painting, one of the great Dutch uh, seascape paintings. And when he finally gets to Rome in 1819, uh, he spends time in Rome. And Rome, of course, was the great uh, centre for the, uh, not, uh, not least for the, the, the Roman Catholic Church, but it's also in uh, the um, 19th century, the place where uh, all gentlemen went on the uh, grand tour. 
and would acquire dubious uh, so-called Michelangelo sculptures or uh, Raphael paintings, many of them complete fakes, and many people were not uh, gifted in uh, discerning what was fake and what was real, and so brought back shed loads of um, uh, paintings to Britain, which are now being consigned to basements of uh, museum stores because of they, they are, um, uh, you know, just copies of, of, of well-known masters. Anyway, uh, Turner comes to Rome, and this is one is painted from the, the loggia up in the Vatican apartments, looking over into St. Peter's Square. And Turner in this painting includes uh, paintings by Claude and uh, Raphael, particularly, and he and uh, the depiction of Raphael and his lover. And, and this is something that also Iron, who spent a great deal of uh, the early part of the 19th century, a great French classical artist, um, spent a great deal of the early 19th century in Rome uh, at this time. And his painting also painted Raphael, so I put that painting there. Um, but there were many, many painting schools within Rome, and the German Romantic painters under uh, uh, Johann Friedrich Overbeck were working in uh, Rome at the time, and, the, and they were the, an important part of the romantic movement within Europe. Uh, so Turner was, was exposed to many of these things. And his first um, visit to Rome, he uh, did not really complete many paintings. He did a lot of sketchbooks, but he it was subsequent visits that he actually uh, comes to terms with, with, with Rome in many, many other ways. But I think it really did affect him. And uh, this particular painting is from the first trip, and, and, it's, and it's a marvellous painting because it shows Turner's mastery of perspective. So we can look in all directions, and it is, it is a, a masterpiece of, of spatial relationships, and he's, he's really uh, captured it so well here, and uh, a terrific painting that can be viewed in London today. And this painting is one of the high points of what we call of his encounter with Rome, and, uh, but the painting that painted back in Britain, uh, Ulysses deriding Polythemus. And uh, this is painted, uh, but obviously based on, on, on the Homer, Homer's um, Odyssey. Um, but what I'm going to talk about here is Turner's mastery of colour in this painting. This for 1829 is an absolute masterpiece of colour. It it has all, it is built really out of the primary colours, red, yellow and blue, uh, but in such a way that it, it, it's an entrancing painting. All the elements of it work, uh, both the, the deep space within it, the, the Claudian type of space, the, the, the scientific engagement in that atmospheric effects and uh, the light, light, almost light emanating from the painting. It's, it's something that really hadn't really occurred in paint before. And it's the very bold use of oil paint as well. But um, Turner here uh, produces this, this, this ex a marvellous painting. The ship is coming the, it, towards us um, it, when we feel movement within this painting. It's, it's not static like uh, so many sea pieces often are where you're viewing, viewing it from afar. He has, he has, he has captured uh, all the wonder of um, uh, the Odyssey in some way and has really engaged with it. And it was considered one of the great masterpieces of the early 19th century and can be viewed in uh, the National Gallery in London. And Turner in 1809 um, uh, establishes a long-term association with um, the Earl of Egremont. And the Earl of Egremont's seat is Petworth House in Sussex. And for any of you who really love Turner's work or British painting or the Grand Tour, I would definitely recommend you go to Petworth House. And Turner painted many spectacular paintings at Petworth. Uh, he enjoyed fishing there and hunting there as well. Um, the, uh, the Earl of Egremont was a great collector of paintings. So Turner not only was painting there, but he was exposed to many great works of art. And so we have works from Titian there, Van Dyck, uh, the former generation, Joshua Reynolds, um, Thomas Gainsborough. Uh, we have uh, works by Benjamin West. Uh, we will have uh, sculptural works by Flaxman. And uh, it's, it's an amazing place is Petworth House. And the art gallery within Petworth House is a great example. It's probably the great example of, of an early uh, 19th century picture gallery. Um, I would say it was on, on par with going to somewhere like the Dulwich Picture Gallery in many ways. Um, and this is Turner's studio at Petworth House. 
um, which uh, you may be lucky enough to get into. They've had some problems with the floor in recent times, so they're not really admitting many people in. But this is a view of the studio. Little change since Turner's day and Turner's easel is there. And that's Turner's watercolour of him actually painting within his studio. And uh, those of you who saw the uh, movie, Mr. Turner will recall seeing uh, uh, this, uh, seeing uh, um, the Mike Lee film, which was uh, all shot on, on location. And uh, there is um, uh, Timothy Spall uh, uh, emoting or channeling Turner uh, in, 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 in the studio, actually working on the easel. So we get a very good idea of what it would have been like to have been there and standing in Turner's studio. You get a great idea of the, the great uh, light coming in through the window. Funnily enough, he's not using north light, which is preferred by painters, but he's using south light. Really, the sun is coming in the window. Most painters prefer a north light. So that's an interesting thing about Turner. He's not afraid to stare into the sun. And in Turner's day, we didn't have tubes of oil paint. They had to be made up in these little bladders of paint uh, uh, to be kept fresh. And so you had to have be some, you had to have something of a technician. Turner in the years up to 1830, his father mixed up a lot of the paint for him. Later on, he did employ uh, studio assistants. And Turner, as I said, Egremont's connection was uh, in, encountered so much great art, particularly this uh, Jacob van der Rysdale, a great Dutch artist. Um, painting, but there are many paintings such as this one that is behind me on my talk tonight, this lake at Petworth Park, uh, looking straight into the sun. And um, I think Egremont was, was one of the great patrons of Turner and, and he, uh, he saw in Turner uh, something really, uh, really amazing. And uh, so today we can walk in Turner's footsteps and, and go there and uh, really engage both with the landscape and the paintings at the same time. And that's something that's really, really good about uh, Petworth Park, um, delightful place. Now, I've always said that Tur uh, Venice brought Turner some sort of sense of ease, some sort of relief. Um, he was a great admirer of the uh, painter uh, Canaletto and Canaletto's paintings. Canaletto worked in London as well as Venice, as we know, but um, uh, Canaletto's paintings were an inspiration to Turner as well. And Turner uh, does a sort of update on, on Canaletto's work. And so here's a painting of his Bridge of Sighs, Ducal Palace, Custom House in Venice, uh, painted in 1833. And we get the whole of the lagoon here. Turner's mastery of architecture, of, of sea craft, of, of the barges and the gondolas. And they've got it all in this painting, really. Uh, it just shows you why Venice was so important to Turner. It, it, it is the quality of light. And many artists subsequently have found Venice since the time of Canaletto and Guardi. Uh, artists like Whistler and Claude Monet and Walter Sickert have all journey, journeyed to Venice and found it a place of great artistic renewal. And it, and it, is, it was for Turner. Turner uh, saw in Venice um, the world, it was the world of Lord Byron, and uh, it, it, it had this uh, great sense of, of vitality about it. Um, it was an impressive place, and of course, it later was the thing that won uh, Ruskin over as well. His, for his trip to Venice um, uh, was foundational to John Ruskin's career, and uh, partly it was these Venetian paintings that attracted uh, John Ruskin to um, uh, Turner. Uh, Turner had been collected by John Ruskin, John James Ruskin, John Ruskin's father. And uh, so uh, uh, it was some of these Venetian paintings that were, were the important ones uh, within that collection. And we can see why the, the colour is unrestrained in these paintings, but he's not trying to do like um, uh, Ulysses deriding Polythemus. No, we're not, we're not doing that in this particular painting. We're looking at a, a modern scene in, in, in Venice, uh, but one just which shows great depth and a great understanding of light and colour. And it's a very, very modern piece of work in which we feel we're involved. We're almost as if we're floating in the boat towards, um, towards the other craft on, on the canal. And the interesting thing about these oil paintings are that he works at them from sketches that he's done in his sketchbook and watercolours he's done in Venice, and they're recreated in London in his studio. So they're not, they're not like Claude Monet when he goes to Venice painting on the spot. Uh, Turner has a wonderful retentive imagination, and he's able to summon up these feelings without photography, uh, but purely reliant upon his sketchbooks and upon memory and feeling. And I think that's something 
really unique about Turner. He is, is an artist who can, can do this in an, an exceptional way. And in 1834, uh, the House of Commons and House of Lords burns down. And uh, this, this dramatic situation is recorded by Turner in a series of paintings. And these paintings uh, are glorious paintings. They, 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 they show the crowds watching the spectacle of the House of Lords and House of Commons with, the, you can see Westminster Abbey in the background illuminated. Uh, but the, the destruction of the House of Lords and House of Commons, a great national event, just like the Battle of Trafalgar, except this is an accidental event, but, um, but still, it's a great event in, in the life of the nation, and uh, Turner records it. And so this is sort of journalism as much as anything else, but it's it's powerful. It's also powerful in his use of colours that uh, have been recommended to him by uh, uh, Michael Faraday, the, the oranges and reds and the chrome colours, the, the chrome pigments, the base metal pigments that uh, are, are used in this are, are, very, um, are very unusual for art at this particular period. And it, it occurs here in this in the wonderful painting, the fighting Temeraire being tugged to her last birth to be broken up. This scene is, is another great uh, Thames scene, the scene of uh, the, the old ship, the ship that had served uh, in the Battle of Trafalgar so well, had been come to Nelson, come to the victory's aid, had been so instrumental in that. It talked about British heroism. It talked also about a whole story of uh, the, the, the people who had fought upon the Temeraire had, in fact, uh, before 1805, had mutinied. And, uh, and yet when Britain needed, uh, were called to their aid, uh, the, the uh, uh, sailors of the Temeraire came, came forward and, um, and, and were, were heroic. So it represented uh, for the life of the nation, um, the passing of the Napoleonic era and, uh, or the, the Nelson's era and, and the Napoleonic Wars. And it was a, the Temeraire, almost like a ghost ship, because remember the masts would have been stripped by the time it was being taken down to Rotherhive. That's something, again, a pictorial license by Turner there. But the little steamboat, the plucky steamboat, is overtaking, is superseding the world of sail. And the uh, great era of Nelson and, uh, coming to an end uh, and what and it's it's, it's bringing about a, a great question uh, in in the minds of uh, the British public this painting but not least because it, it is a tremendous painting about uh, the old the new uh, and it, it is so poetic uh, it, and it is one of the greatest paintings we have in in Britain uh, uh, such a such a brilliant work um, that it has so much within it. And again, it's a celebration of the modern and, and, and the new. Uh, Turner was afraid to do that in, in, in a painting, uh, and yet so shocking in, in some ways too, that you, would, that you would do something like this. And a painting too, which is in Boston, which uh, again is a painting that has attracted so much has been written about it, uh, particularly uh, Mark Twain wrote extensively on this painting. It, was, it converted him really to uh, look at the work of Turner and it has done so since. And it concerns, um, this is known as the slave ship and it's originally titled The Slavers Throwing Overboard the Dead and Dying Typhoon Coming On. So it, 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 it emotes all of Turner's pessimism about human nature and uh, man's depravity and being overwhelmed by uh, enormous forces, but it also comments upon a, a very significant um, uh, happening in, in, the 18th, in the 18th century, the Zong Massacre, where um, many African slaves were thrown overboard uh in in into the into the ocean and we can see their chains in the sea and their and their hands waving about in the waves and uh bigger ships eat a uh, bigger fish eating smaller fish uh sort of again uh commenting about the whole the, the whole um, uh injustice of this all and this is an age where the question within Britain about slavery had been settled uh, through William Wilberforce, but it certainly hadn't been in a new settled in a new world. So it provokes these these great questions, and uh, it's a very very important painting of 1840 and uh, a powerful piece of work. But again, astonishingly modern in its in its use of colour and uh, and application of paint. 
and the passing of the Napoleonic Age is recorded too. This is the uh, Napoleon room at Petworth House. Um, uh, uh, there we see uh, the Duke of Wellington as um, sculpted by Chantry, the great sculptor of the, of the era. And then behind it, Thomas Phillips' portrait of Napoleon. And then here we have the painting, The Exile and the Rock Limpet. We see uh, the um, painting of 1842 by Turner of, um, of uh, to, of Napoleon's exile on St Helena and the diminutive figure of Napoleon and the blood red sky and the passing uh, uh, all as, as the blood soaked land and, and, and sunset uh, and it talks about that so it's this war and then the painting next to it is a painting painted as its companion piece Peace uh, Burial at Sea which is about his dear friend uh, the Scottish artist David Wilkie being buried at sea. Again, we have the same idea about the new and the old. We have the black sails of the sailing ship uh, from which uh, 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 Sir David Wilkie's uh, uh, body is being committed to the sea. And then we have the plumes of smoke and a new world coming on. And so it, he's looking at all those things within these paintings. And at Petworth House, you can go to the um, Napoleon Room and it's, and it's very relevant. And of course, uh, Turner himself, a great visitor to Petworth House, knew all about the Napoleon Room. And this is another painting of this golden period of, of Turner, this late period of Turner, um, Rain, Steam and Speed, the Great Western Railway. And again here, he, he celebrates the coming on of the new. So we have the great new railway line of, of Isambard Kingdom Brunel, uh, crossing Maidenhead Bridge, this double span brick bridge, uh, a masterpiece of engineering, uh, and, the, and the seven foot gauge a North Star train coming towards us. Uh, there is a small hare trying to outpass, outpace the train, but it will be the train which catches it up. Over on the left, we have the old Bath Road Bridge, the A4 bridge as we know it, uh, if we live in England. And of course, the coach and horses will be overtaken by the, the new train and the new era. And we, and we are caught up again in this great mist and uh, light and the great sense of space as we look back towards London. But, it, but the future is coming towards us in this painting. And it's, it's a very, very modern, very, very innovative piece of work that fully engages with uh, the new era. And Turner paints this one too at the same period. Uh, this one, The Snowstorm, a very, very famous painting by Turner, uh, again featuring <laughs> a steamship, uh, you can see, but it's also <coughs> one in which there's a little bit of myth making about it. It is, it is probably unlikely that Turner ever really was lashed to a mast to observe a, a storm at sea. Um, he, he spoke about it, but it is unlikely that that really did happen. Uh, but of course, it's, it's a great story. And, um, but what, what might have influenced this even more than that was Faraday's uh, bar magnet experiments, where he had watched iron filings um, being uh, swirled around with, with, the, with, uh, with the magnet underneath a piece of paper. And so we can see uh, in Faraday's experiment on the right, uh, sort of in Turner's painting, and there is a lot of uh, direct uh, link between the two, uh, particularly because of the two men's uh, knowing one another. Uh, so it's an extremely uh, exciting painting, this one. Um, and, and as with all of these more abstract versions by Turner, you've got to spend a lot of time looking at them, but they come into focus. Believe me, at first things that look indistinct become distinct, and it's almost like acclimatizing your eyes as you would have in the gallery in Queen Anne Street. You have to acclimatize your eyes to Turner's work and take time and you have to stand there and let the painting almost come to you and speak to you. But he became a man who was noted for being very eccentric in the later part of his life. Um, Varnishing Day became a spectacular event at the Royal Academy. Uh, there's William Parrott's painting of Turner on Varnishing Day in, in 1846 painting one of his paintings. Now, uh, 
most artists, when they brought their works to the Royal Academy in the 1840s and 50s to be varnished, were just putting on a little uh, coat of varnish or a little retouch here and there so that their works would be seen. Uh, not in Turner's case, he would perhaps sometimes almost entirely repaint the painting with great um, amounts of uh, colour and paint and, uh, and, and almost rework it. Uh, uh, such was his um, eccentricity, as we might say. And some of the late paintings were very hard to understand, but to our modern eyes, we can appreciate things like the Falls of the Clyde, 1844. But to eyes, early 19th century eyes, this must have been baffling. Um, it looks like an out of focus photograph. Uh, it could look like a Claude Monet even. And no surprise that in 1870, when Monet and Pissarro uh, visited the National Gallery, Turner is mentioned. Uh, ten, Sir Kenneth Clark, uh, the director of the National Gallery in the, eight, in the 1930s, uh, a great champion of Turner, rather like Ruskin, um, uh, talks uh, about abstraction within Turner's work. And uh, he, he, he has something of a spat with the art historian Herbert Reed. And you can read about that in The Listener in this article. That's quite an interesting piece on that. And John Everett Neely does a little drawing of Turner at the 1850 Royal Academy. And there we are, a nice little portrait of Turner there on varnishing day. And it was a spectacular thing every year. And so much so that some of these, these late paintings, which uh, are bequeathed to the nation, uh, were sort of rolled up on Turner's death because they were thought of as, uh, um, you know, sort of eccentric works, the works of someone in their decline rather than someone who is coming to this glorious end to their career. And of course, they are very, very modern, and we don't know that they were completely finished. But what we can see in them is something absolutely brilliant, that he is working again uh, from his great folio of drawings, and he's reworking subjects and, and learning something new. And he's, even as a man in his later part of his life, he is still engaging with the new and the modern. And it's very, very exciting to see. And this one, Norham Castle, is one of his great late paintings. And of course, the tongues are wag wag wagging. Uh, Thornbury, who writes on, on Turner, uh, called, uh, you know, is, is critic, highly critical of Turner's work. And, and they believe that since the 18, late 1830s, he hasn't painted anything very good uh, or understandable or, or and, and uh, some even see mental decline uh, in Turner. But uh, it's during this period in 1840, uh, it, Ruskin meets, um, uh, uh, Turner for the first time, the young John Ruskin, he's 21 years old, he's come from uh, uh, Oxford and he meets Turner and uh, they follow, they form an unlikely um, relationship in the last years of Turner's life, uh, for the last 11 years of Turner's life. Uh, John Ruskin is a frequent visitor to Turner and Turner's studio and Turner um, Turner's greatest champion is John Ruskin, and had it not been for John Ruskin, it, it, it is unlikely much of what we know about Turner would, would be publicly known, and indeed certain works may not have survived. Uh, John Ruskin uh, writes his defence of Turner in his first volume of Modern Painters, which I spoke on uh, last year, uh, but it's a very thorough def defence of, of Turner as an artist and an artist to, to be engaged with and to be reckoned with. And Ruskin, I think, rightly cites that, that Turner, Joseph Turner, is as great as Claude and as artists from the Renaissance. Uh, he is an artist who is uh, of a superb power and insight and uh, what many of us consider him to be Britain's greatest artist of all time. And uh, Ruskin uh, also is not uncritical. Ruskin, as we know, is the great, great critic. He, he, he does say things about some of Turner's late work, particularly the vortex paintings where everything is sort of almost sucked into this sort of vortex. He talks about them and he says he won't take any notice of them when there's this uh, uh, retrospective exhibition. Likewise, Ruskin has also been accused of destroying a number of Turner's late uh, sketchbooks, the erotic drawings, which are quite controversial. Uh, however, many of these sketchbooks still exist and we don't really think he did destroy too many sketchbooks. And some of the drawings, which are called erotic drawings, are just unconventional life drawings, that is the study of the nude, they are not, they're, they're not pornography. So uh, these, these erotic drawings, which he was accused of destroying, are rather um, something that some people have, have uh, 
sort of put on John Ruskin's back because uh, of their dislike of John Ruskin. Ruskin did a wonderful work for Turner in that he catalogued so many of the sketchbooks and so many of the paintings. And we have a well, we have a lot to thank Ruskin for uh, in, in, in citing what works for what and reading the Turner's handwriting on little notes in, in, in the books and uh, uh, all of that thing. And, and when you consider he left something like 19,000 works on paper, we have a great deal to thank uh, John Ruskin for his assiduous work on Turner. And so uh, we come to the end of Turner's life. He buys, um, uh, four years before the end of his life, he buys this place on in Chelsea at Cheney Walk, where he can view uh, the ships from his little roof terrace and that little telescope. Uh, he looks he looks to the sun always. I hope he didn't look just with directly with a telescope because that wouldn't do him too much good for him. But uh, but he but he is obsessed with the sun. And uh, as he had been uh, the, with the Royal Society and Herschel's experiments through the prism and uh, Turner um, makes this enigmatic statement to John Ruskin as he lies on his deathbed and he whispers to John Ruskin, the sun is God. We don't exactly know what uh, uh, Turner meant by this. He meant the S-U-N is God. Um, uh, Turner's late paintings, there's the angel standing in the sun, they're all obsessed with this, with, with looking into the sun, into light. Uh, so uh, they are peculiar works, but uh, they are works of great power and, and uh, captivation. And uh, so Turner's life ends in 1851. He, he leaves this enormous body of work uh, to Britain. He, he requests in his will uh, that, that his works are hung next to Claude, Lorraine, his great early hero, among the paintings of Titian and uh, Del Colombo, uh, he is he is leaving his work. His works are initially hung at Marlborough House in Pall Mall. Um, the bequest of over three hundred oils and nineteen thousand works on paper uh, creates an enormous headache for the Beaumont and those and uh, Charles Eastlake are setting up the uh, uh, National Gallery collections. Um, it's been resolved somewhat by the building of the Claw Gallery in Tate Britain and um, his work and then splitting some of his works into the main National Gallery British collection. So uh, the um, Fighting Temeraire and Ulysses deriding Polythemus in, in the National Gallery, whereas uh, the, 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 the shipwreck is at the Claw Gallery. Um, we've, we've come to sort of an accommodation of Turner, but because his legacy is so great, uh, we can never show all of his work. His work is, is there's just so much of it. And, uh, but they do a wonderful work at the Claw Gallery at Tate Britain and, and, and help us to understand his world and, and his art, which is uh, foundational really to an understanding of British art and the art of the 19th century, particularly such as his importance as an artist. So I come to an end. 